<laughs> this is a lot of fun. Today is going to be interesting because I'm recording a bunch of teaching tapes. And the only thing I could think of was when I wanted to do this segment, which is uh, on fallacy and fallacies that, uh, or argument or debate or however you want to call it, but basically on fallacy was that I wanted to call the series Educating the Idiot. <laughs> You know, they, you know, you're not an idiot, and neither am I. But you remember the idiot's guide, you know, to everything. You know, idiot's guide to this, idiot's guide to the Bible, idiot's guide to gardening, idiot's guide to idiocy. <laughs> well, I still think about it. Idiot's guide to fallacy. You know, I might be thinking about that. Although I'm sure there's a book out there, so I can't use idiot's guide because, after all, that's been copyrighted. Some idiot did it. <laughs> And let's see, God doesn't want me calling anyone an idiot, so you know, I probably shouldn't call it Idiot's Guide because I could make up that there's none, none of us are idiots, but that there's someone out there that we're educating that is an idiot, only he's not a real human being, so we'll just say that there's some idiot out there. But then you might get the wrong impression that you can call someone an idiot, so then I kind of went, well, you know, maybe we'll just you know, comment on, well, we can't call people stupid even if they are dumb. Because after all, God said, don't call anyone stupid, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> so, oh well, we're kind of lost with what we're going to title this series. So by the time I get done with recording it, we'll probably put something on it, and it'll be educating something. I don't know. Hopefully, you're going to learn something out of this series, and that's why we say Google it to find the facts. Because the reality is, you're being deceived all the time about information. You have no background no teaching and nowhere in your education process have you been told to really how to evaluate information to do information analysis information perspective and information derivatives meaning that you can derive certain meanings in a variety of ways from the same type of information that's been put out which sometimes would be called propaganda or in some ways patriotism because some people that call patriotism really are just using propaganda in order to wave something in front of you that if you're part of that country you would call it patriotism but if you're not part of that country you'd call it propaganda you see how that works perspective differentiates that which is propaganda from patriotic statements because after all right now in America we have people waving the flag and saying well our founding fathers and they're full of it they're making up stories about the Founding Fathers that aren't true. There's so much propaganda out there that I'm sure you don't even know which one's true and which one's false. Because you probably haven't studied history that much. But you have a favorite teacher that's using fallacies in order to get you to believe in what they're saying. Because here's the way the news works. We bring in an expert and we say, oh, well, you know, the expert says. And then you listen to the expert and you go, oh, so that's what's true. And then you go to another channel and an expert tells you something else completely opposite. And you know that's true because guess what? You know how many times everything is going to give you cancer. And then they find out, no it's not, yes it is, no it's not, yes it is. Because skewered results are being used and disinformation often is presented to masses in order to confuse the issue. And that's listed here in fallacy. So this whole series really is kind of going to benefit you in a lot of variety of ways and that's why we're kind of like talking about this up front is that one you're going to be able to study your Bible better once you kind of get through this big negative aspect of it that we're going to talk about at first which is the whole brainwashing part that's going on two you're going to be able to understand better what your pastor is saying or teacher or elder or deacon or whoever it is that you're you know doing Bible study with as well as being able to understand the news and maybe even people that you talk to. Because you see, you're not given a class on interpersonal communication skills unless you go to universities, unless you go to college, or you study on your own in some way that you can develop these types of communicative devices with which you can relate information in certain parameters that you either get the desired results or you recognize the, that you're being manipulated for the results. And so that's why you see so much in politics, you know, double speak and talking these different things and ad hominem arguments as well as straw man arguments. And you hear these words that you don't necessarily know what they mean, but you kind of got an idea that it's not so good, that it's being used against someone. So, you know, are they like, you know, deceiving you? Yeah. And it's going on all the 
time. Jesus eliminated fallacy by making yes, yes, and no, no, and nobody lives by it. My wife knows I am very adamant about that. I want her to say yes when she means yes and no when she means no, and I use it on her regularly, and she knows that. And so a lot of what you're going to experience in these videotape series about fallacy is maybe eye-opening for the first time. You may be shocked at how devious the tongue is, as well as the mind, when it's being used in logic and argument to convince you of something <laughs> that you probably wouldn't have fell for, except that it's worded in a very, very sneaky, sneaky way. It's kind of like a shell game. The best way I can explain it is that it's a verbal shell game that goes on, and most people in argumentation kind of learn how to evaluate it and identify it pretty quickly. And then they learn how to do what's called counter argumentation, where they're like countering back with the same gimmick. And so it becomes kind of a game where they're playing back and forth. Sadly, where I learned and saw most of it was in Jewish rabbis, you know, is that there was a lot of argumentation and fallacies being portrayed back and forth within the rabbinical literature and oral tradition that the argumentation was always done in such a way as to hide the element of truth to confuse in some ways and abuse the scripture so that they wouldn't come to the logical conclusion that God was obviously in my mind, you know, driving or d directing them towards, but each rabbinical source seemed to be wanting to persuade in a negative way a person to follow them in their way. And I just didn't, I saw it more as a philosophical, you know, mental gamemanship than an actual realization of what the scriptures were saying. So you're going to learn a lot. You know, it, it definitely opened my eyes. I, I take these materials uh, graciously, <laughs> thank you, by the way, from Hebrew for Christians. Is that, a, um, oh, I forget what his name is. Let me see if I have it here. I might, I might, on the last page, who knows. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. Everybody knows him. That, well, not everybody. By John Parsons, that's right. John Parsons worked with Zola Levitt Ministries, and you know he does Hebrew for Christians, and I recommend him. You go to his site. It's safe. You know, it's a, He's a Messianic Jew, or he's a Jew that knows Jesus, and he's willing to share with you the truth and the reality of being a Christian and being a Jew and how not to be a Messianic messed up one, but how you can be an accurate person who wants to enjoy the traditions without getting into the legalisms that sometimes these Torah observant people you've seen or heard about or some of these messed up messianics who think they're Jews and aren't or these Jews that seem to you have to make them into Gentiles or make them into Jews. That's not John. <laughs> John's been around for a long time and so is his site, Hebrew for Christians. There's very few uh, Jewish Christian sites I would recommend for study because a lot of them have gotten wrapped up into either money making or somehow manipulating you into, you know, again, logic and all these argumentation, but getting you into some kind of, you know, Jewish Hebrew roots thing, which, frankly, I don't want to be in the roots. I'd rather be the fruit, you know. So if you want to be in the roots, well, you go ahead. You stick your feet in the dirt, and, you know, stick your nose in the dirt, and stick your hands in the dirt, and then dig down, and you could be in the roots. But I think that in the tree of righteousness, in the tree of life, you'd rather be a fruit of God than be the roots of God. <laughs> no offense. Now, it's nice to know what the whole tree is, but I don't think you want to be stuck in the roots all the time. It's nice to know where the roots came from. And I, you know, I know my roots, and you know, you know your roots if you study them. But get out of it. You know, move on. The roots are meant to suck up stuff and suck the life out of the soil. Pardon me, but that doesn't sound like a positive thing. Now, the fruit gets the benefits of all that and gets to be, hey, I'm joyful. Oh, well, I'm peace. Oh, well, I'm love. So. <laughs> you decide for yourself where you want to be. But Chosen People Ministries, you know, I, I pretty much like them, you know, and they, they've done a wonderful ministry. Now they're kind of like dead in the water. Jews for Jesus, they're kind of still active, but not as much as they used to be, you know, kind of fading away. But still they're active and they're wonderful and they got great ministry work. Um, John Parsons, Hebrew for Christians, again, great site to learn Hebrew. You learn it in a better way than I know anybody else learning it. Um, other than that, you know, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of these Hebraic roots things and sacred namers and all stuff. It's all false. I was there when they started, you know, and a lot of it's just junk, you know. God bless Eddie Chumney when he started, but guess what? Kind of went off on tangents, and there's a lot of messed up stuff out there, so be careful. So anyways, getting back to our topic, because the material comes from 
Hebrew for Christians, I can recommend that you go there. And he pulls a lot of it, I think, from Kierkegaard, and um, I may be saying that name wrong, but he brings it from his, if you go to the website, you can look on it on the very first page, and you go to Clear Thinking, and then you click on it. When you click on Clear Thinking, you'll see these articles and discussions about logic. And it's pretty simple. I mean, it's a very beautiful site. You can see how it's lined out, you know, kind of here. And he does a lot of graphics with it, and he does a lot of information, more than you'll probably want to know. And one of the first ones that we're going to discuss, you know, in this series is 38 Dishonest Tricks of Argument. And it's very good. I mean, it was, well, 38 Tricks of Argument, Watching for Sophistry in Everyday Life. Now, this particular tape will probably blow you out of the water. Now, when we get to the individual fallacies, like informal fallacies, which is probably the next one, or maybe in a few tapes, eh, probably the next one, then we'll take apart each individual fallacy and show you what that means, like if an ad hominem attack, or a personification, or a, a faulty distribution, or invalid sampling, you know, some of these terms for what they mean. We'll get in depth on it and spend a tape on each one so that way it's better understood and we'll show a scriptural uh, manipulation as well as a news manipulation and maybe a personal manipulation, how applying it to personal communication sometimes. So we're going to try to examine it in three different areas of your life so that you can apply it to, again, your spirit, your soul, and your body because personal would be emotional and um, I already forgot what three I was going to do. <laughs> I know they're pretty, I know, I know spirit, soul, and body, but I was trying to figure out which was, what was I talking about as far as making it applicable. But the point being is that in scriptural, that would be spiritual, obviously. And that in manipulation, whether it be through political or the news, there we go. And political could be into personal, so sometimes they do personal attacks and that's how you get it. Or into, you know, family relationships, the same thing applies. So it would be relationshipal types of fallacies and then also into the news you know because the news is where you obviously are affected greatly by it and that's manipulated all over the place so it'll warn you about prophecy and everything else so we can get into those three when we get into the next tape and we'll do them one by one you know make a pretty simple format it'll be more of an educated idiot's guide to it than <laughs> educating the idiot like this right now because I'm educating me on really how much of this material that I can't present but this first one, which is 38 dishonest tricks of argument, we'll just kind of flip through fast so you don't have to listen too long. And it's very short, you know. <laughs> but at least you'll hear the terms, and that's the only reason why I'm bringing this up. I'm not going to go into each one in real in-depth material or anything like that. I just want you to hear the terms so you'll begin to come to term with the fact that manipulation is going on all the time. And pardon me, but sometimes we even manipulate ourselves with some of the ways that we communicate. So, getting to it. Dishonest tricks of argument. Here are 38 dishonest tricks of argument taken from Straight and Crooked Thinking by Robert Thulis from Pan Books, whatever. Copyright 1930, 53, and 74. Much discourse in public and personal life is filled with these mental tricks. First one, <laughs> I know I had to kind of look, what is that, oh yeah. The first one is emotional language, and it's called the use of emotionally toned words. And emotional language is when a person uses either hype, like they decide to, well, you effing this, and you, you know, all effing people know that those effing people, and them reggin, whatever, dumb and jumping, jumping, Jiminy Cricket type people, which would be emotionally overloaded language. But you see, there's also a subtler form of that, where you take what we call politically correct statements, where you downtone, and this is where something you're going to find interesting in news, and when we get into the explanation of it, that's why there's two different types. Emotional language, form of manipulation, a fallacy that's being used, on you regularly is when they take monotone and play all the words down to their elimination. For instance, I'll give you one in the um, what do I want to say? The armed forces terminology that you've already been brainwashed with, and you didn't even know this. You've been manipulated to think of people as. Um, 
soft targets or let's see what do they call it now um, not casualties but they call it um, it means consequence of an action like when there's an attack there are consequences of innocent people dying so when you say that they are let me think of the word I can think of it real quick if I can't I'll skip it They're not, it's like a word that means incidental. I'm trying to, it's funny, I can't think of it because I've got all this logic going. <laughs> not incidental targets, but. Um, well, great. <laughs> I can't think of the word, and you probably have it, and you can't tell me. What it means is that when there's an attack and you're going after, like, say, a specific group of men that are terrorists and then the innocent bystanders get killed, there's a term that they're using in the news that means just secondary, you know, consequence or they're accidentally, you know, harmed in harm's way. And so they're called, I can't even think of the word. The reason why you use that term is because you don't want to come to consequence with saying a bloodied and dead person that was a human being and a real life that died that would have been your mother or father because you wouldn't call that secondary factor of somebody dying if it was your mother and father you wouldn't call them that term you would call them my god man they were my mother and they were my father they were my brother they were my sister so you see taking that personification of it out of it and making it neutral then suddenly you can deal with the topic see it's like if you deal with terrorists okay what are terrorists you know, really. Because right now we use this term Al-Qaeda for everybody. Al-Qaeda is everything that is not necessarily Al-Qaeda. <laughs> oh, we'll call it that, you know, because it covers everything that we would have in the past called a certain individual group. But when we say Al-Qaeda, then it identifies it for people. So that makes it neutral because then it's not an individual person. Or, for instance, like right now, something that you do when it comes to emotional language is you use President Obama as a scapegoat. And that's obvious. I mean, come on now. No one man can do everything that he's blamed for. <laughs> it can't happen. I mean, not even the Antichrist can pull off all the stuff that people are blaming him for. <laughs> I mean, it cracks me up. It's like, get real. So, for the sake of knowing what emotional language is, begin to identify the facts for a minute, you know, that when you do it to yourself, you can pick it up like being President Obama. You know, you're blaming him for everything that, you know, the weather didn't come out right today, so you blame it on him, you know, because it's global warming or global cold cooling. You know, I mean, you know, it just gets to be crazy, but people actually do that. So emotional language, whether it's hyping it up or bringing it down to what we call politically correct speech when you say that, you know, we all need to get along, you know, and we don't use the words like homosexual or pervert or queer, you know, I mean, pardon me, but, you know, the people that are in different parts of the country still do use those languages. Or like when they say that you can't say the word nigger in some context within the black community, but the black community itself always says it. So you know as well as I do that in communication within the realm of the environment, when it comes to people dealing within their own set um, groupings, shoot, Jews call each other Nazis all the time. I mean, I can say that, or kike, you know, I mean, the stupid word kike, I don't know where that came from. But, you know, in Jewish culture, there's so much humor and so much laughing and so much preventative of other people being persecuted that yes, we get very adamant about you know, not letting other people say it, but you know, we get pretty much carried away when we get into humor about saying it about ourselves. You know, I mean, Mel Brooks was famous for playing Hitler. <laughs> uh, but now it's like, no, don't call him Nazi, don't play the Nazi card, we gotta quit saying this, quit saying that, you know, doing this and doing that. That's emotional language, number one. And we'll move faster as we go along. Number two is faulty distribution. This is a famous one. Making a statement in which all is implied, but some is true. For instance, like when someone says to you, we all know. No, we don't. Some know. Never say all. That's a truism. Every time they tell you all people about anything, like all whites or all blacks or all Hispanics or Al-Qaeda or Hispanic vote or this vote or that vote, they're implying all, but it doesn't mean it's true. Some 
And it could be any sum. It could be the majority or the minority. But they're going to say the word by faulty distribution. They're going to use it to imply. So whenever a statement's being made, what they do is they begin to say, well, you know, the Hispanic vote, you know, has constantly been picking, you know, a certain candidate, you know, in this area. And then, you know, and never mind that the Hispanic vote in that particular environment was either, you know, persuaded to vote that way and doesn't vote that way anymore and hasn't done in the last 50 years, but they don't add the rest of the facts. So it's always an all that covers a lie. So anytime you hear that word, we all know, I mean, in scriptures, this is where it's famous for. And that's why I bring it up a lot about in scriptures, because I hate that. As soon as somebody says that on the internet, I'm right at them. I'm right there in their face and saying, no, we don't. Or I'll say no with a period, because it's not true. I know for a fact, fallacy is always covered by the word all. Anytime they use the word all, it's a fallacy. It is going to cover a lie. And in scripture, that's famous way of doing it for pastors or elders or teachers or people that just don't know any better. <sighs> it drives me crazy. So that's why we're very educating the idiot on this thing, you know, because I'm the idiot, really, because I get all wound up about this because I see it everywhere I look. People doing it. And I'm... <laughs> That's me crazy because I keep thinking, don't you have any discernment? Don't you know any better? Come on now. Don't pull this. I know. <laughs> and other people don't. And then I point it out to them and they're like, wow, I see it everywhere I go. I say, yeah, I know. <laughs> Scary, huh? Or invalid sampling. Proof by selected instances. It's kind of like when they say <laughs> the poll, <laughs> and you know this in politics right now, invalid sampling. The latest Washington poll says, and you know that that poll is not going to be accurate because the next poll that comes out the next day is completely changed, you know, and then wherever you get your poll from, and then if you look at the numbers, well, how many people were sampled? 1,000. So the poll samples 1,000 people to cover 7 million in America, or more, I forget, now I'm 7 million, I was thinking Jews. <laughs> oh well, I told you my mind's kind of like way off on tangents on insampli invalid sampling. But whenever you get into invalid sampling, look at the number. How many people are sampled? It's not accurate. They say plus or minus three or four. No, because people will lie on polls. You have poll sitters that go to Walmart and sit there and here, could you sign this? You know, and they're taking samples because they're selling that to people on the web for polls. So when you get money involved, it isn't accurate. Watch out for invalid sampling. You know, you just don't get <laughs> correct information. You know, it's like. Whenever somebody uses a sampling in order to prove something, that's when you know it's false. Because it says right here, uh, approach, dealt with dishonestly by selecting instances opposing your opponent's contention or by honestly pointing out the true form of a proof as a statistical problem in association and either supplying the required numerical facts or pointing out that your opponent has got none of them. Interesting, isn't it? Because you're using it either way. You manipulate it back and forth in order to argue against a person or against a thing or against your situation or circumstance. It's manipulation. Okay, number four, reduction ad absurdum. <laughs> uh, extension of a proposition by contradiction or by deliberate misrepresentation. In other words, you just change what they say and repeat it back to them. I have that happen to me all the time because a person when they read it don't quote you back they change your words to add what they think you said and then they tell you back it and I'm always having to say no that's not what I said what I said I meant because I choose my words carefully on the internet and so in doing that I'm very specific about which words I use so if you ever read what I'm writing you'll see that maybe you don't understand it maybe it sounds a little you know curt or short or abrupt or maybe not as loving as you think that it should be. But there's a reason why I choose those words because people have, through the early days back when I was way back, when AOL and on Usenet and bulletin boards and everything else used to debate with people and they would misquote me on purpose and try to attack me you know, about my argument or about things that I was presenting as far as information was concerned about Jesus and about the Bible and about sometimes messianic, because I was in the messianic movement for a while. And, teaching them and, you know, trying to get people to quit going into, you know, all the wrong stuff and stick with the right stuff. And also, you know, all kinds of things about, you know, eschatology and, you know, end times. 
but in arguing, you don't get very far. You know, it's like that was very well known. You know, but the point is, is that when people misquote you, they are using that, and you need to identify that back to them immediately because that's supposition that's trying to make you agree with them. And whenever there's agreement between you, you're mentally, believe it or not, being brainwashed yourself by agreement. You can't accept a premise that a person is making that's wrong. If you do, you're already down the road and you're making the wrong step. You don't go to the left one step in order to go two steps to the right. It doesn't work that way. Not in the conscious and subconscious mind when you're trying to deal with truth. Evasion of truth. Evasion of a sound refutation of an argument by the use of sophistical formula or other distracting method. In other words, when you bombard someone with a ton of information, like sometimes you quote scripture. There are so many people that quote scripture that have nothing to do with what they're saying and they think it's a proof, but it's not. But it's meant to overwhelm you because it's a whole volume of stuff that's right there for you to read through that's supposed to keep you distracted. You've seen this on lawyer stories where you see that a lawsuit comes up and then they do a motion for exploratory. And when they do a motion for exploratory, then they send them huge numbers of boxes of tons of information and they bury the one piece that they asked for deep inside of it so that they hope that they never find it. Because they do release the information, but it's buried in all this other distraction. And that's kind of what Christians do too when they're doing it on the internet by way of giving you volumes of this so-and-so said or this said or according to scripture that really doesn't apply. Or even when it does apply, they're burying you in it. No, your point isn't being met. It's called thinking. Jesus used a very sophisticated way of identification when it came to talking to individual people. He said to the Pharisee, the young Pharisee that he loved, he said, the Pharisee coming up to him and said, you know, a young man, and he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, what, and Jesus answers them right back immediately, what do the scriptures say and how do you interpret them? That's the point. You see, everyone has an interpretation. Everyone has a way that they evaluate and deal with certain amounts of information. So Jesus wanted to know how he said the scriptures say. So that way he could identify where he's coming from and then speak to where he was at. That we don't do nowadays in communication. And that's something that we should get back to. And that's what will happen when we go on in these studies. Now we're going to stop with this so that you know that you don't have to sit here through another... Let's see, what did we say? There were 38 and we just went through 5. Can you imagine that? I'm bombarding you and burying you in all of this sophistry that's going to completely communicate to you confusion unless you take it with a grain of salt and realize that we're identifying the words and the names and we're just trying to get you to hear them with a brief overview and then later we'll go through them in detail where we'll line it out. We'll say this is like strong argument and then we'll show you with a line in it, you know, the sentence that's being made like A plus B. You know, I, I don't know if we have some of the examples in here on this particular one, but when we get into informal fallacies, then it actually says a, an example of one that's pretty simple that's like, I think it says something like, Sacrament, if, it, here's the word that's, here's the presentation that's used, and I'll make it up as using different example, but the same way that they said it. If Sacramento is the cap, no, if Los Angeles is the capital of California, then it would be in California. That's point A. So somebody says that, says if, you know, or say some place that you don't know because you already know what the capital of California is, don't you? Okay, then let's do something else. Let's pick if... I can't pick one. Let's just stick with that one that you do know so that way you'll see the point. If Los Angeles is the capital of California, then California must be in... then, then Los Angeles must be in California. Then B... Los Angeles is in California. You see, B is the fact. A presented the argument or the question, if. They start off with if. So then it says, after A and B, C. Los Angeles is the capital of California. No, that's false. It is true that Los Angeles is in California. It is true that Los Angeles is the biggest city in California. But 
the first sentence was if Los Angeles was the capital of California, then it would be in California. You know, so it's kind of leading you to a certain place, and then it kind of you know distracts you with a line that's a fact. Then it presents you a conclusion that's completely wrong. That's what we call fallacy. That's when it's kind of like, in a certain simple way, you know, that that sounds too simple to be true that people believe it. But when we put it into scriptures and we line it out, we use everyday examples for you. So I hope that this beginning of fallacies, educating the idiot, will begin to explain how we're going to do this, and it won't be boring to you because we'll get to where it's you know realistic. But at first, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like you know interesting to some to some it's going to be boring and you may want to skip these videos because again this isn't this isn't something that you normally you know are going to be given except in collegiate classes but maybe once you begin to listen to it you begin to understand how you're being deceived and once you know you're being deceived then you can see the truth in it the next time that we get together and talk, we're going to talk about distraction, non sequiturs, lesser of two evils, a false dilemma, appeal to moderation, Hegel's fallacy, appeal to causatory, and formal fallacy. Those are some of the basic ones that are really kind of like in there. So I hope that it's been helpful. If it hasn't, don't watch these. <laughs> it's that simple. I'm going to make them because I need them for other people to refer to when they need to go back to to look at. So if you don't get it right now, just recognize that you know where the tapes are and you know where the site is. So go to Hebrew for Christians and you can read it for yourself. And you can just look under, again, Clear Thinking from Hebrews for Christians, John Day Parsons' site, and um, real easy to find. I mean, that's the way it is. Hebrew, H-E-B-R-E-W, number four, and then Christian, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-S. That's how easy, dot com. And you can read it and do it for yourself, actually. But with these videos, I think sometimes it helps people. So, praise the Lord. I hope that, you know, in Educating the Idiot series, that once we get through the 38, we can begin to evaluate, you know, information. Because I think we're just going to call these first 38 Educating the Idiot. See? I got away with it. Ah, I like it. <laughs> and remember, whenever you want to know the truth, Google to find facts. Now, you may get too many facts, but that's why we're going to deal with the dishonest tricks of argument.